perfect, but that's what we're striving for. You know, we're striving for that uh, that balance. Hmm. I mean, after spending so long making a game like in this style, do you think that you still have more that you could do with this this sort of mold of like a puzzle game with very open puzzles and exploration, or do you think that like you're kind of checked out on this concept for a while and you want to try something really different? I think I could definitely take a break and do something different, um, especially in terms of scale, uh, I think. But that's a very common thing you hear, especially from uh, first-time game makers like us. It's like, we were so ambitious, we made this huge thing. Now we want to make something small. Um, and, I, I mean, I do, I do have ideas uh, about more puzzle games that I'm really interested in. And keep in mind, this is our first game, and we did learn a lot. And you know, I think there are better ways to go. We there are better ways and worse ways to go about building stuff. And we learned we learned a lot of that. Um, that said, I could definitely see myself revisiting um, something that captures this same level of uh, discovery and um, kind of deciphering. Um, sort of a something we kind of kept in mind a lot was the idea of something that was alien but decipherable. This kind of familiar unfamiliarity, I think, is is a feeling that I feel strongly about. Uh, but um, and I could definitely revisit that again. But I mean, yeah, we'll see. Hmm. Maybe uh, maybe I'll make a hallway shooter next. Who knows, <laughs> man? Like it's. It's all good. It's all good. Can it be like an actual hallway shooter? Like the goal is you fight hallways. <laughs> now we're on to something. You know, this is this is getting interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what were those big takeaways? You're talking about like you learned a lot of lessons while doing this. What do you think the biggest ones were? Uh, scope, for sure. Um, we we built something massive. Um, the game was arguably done a little over a year ago, but in order to get it finished, it took us another year. You know, uh, if we had built something radically smaller, I think that would uh, not even radically smaller, like just smaller. I think I think that would have been good. Also, embracing iteration. Um, when we first started, um, we knew we were iterating. We knew we were prototyping, but too early. We thought we were making the final game, and we're like, and then when you realize shortly after working for a month on something that oh, this isn't going to work. This sucks, and then you have to throw it out. Because you're in the mindset that you were working on the final game, it that feeling becomes very demotivating. So um, I think if we, but that just comes with experience. Um, I believe Rami Ismail recently, my wife told me this, so I may be misquoting, but for every day of prototyping uh, things, they they ended up um, with a few months of polish and. I think it's a very like uh, very salient point is like you know getting this thing to this level is 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 so much so much of the work and uh, yeah I, that's definitely I think a mistake that we wouldn't make in the future hmm. or try not to at least or be more aware of I'm sure we'd make plenty more mistakes as well oh certainly it's just kind of how things work um, when when you're making a game of this scope with such a small team, how do you pull it off? Like, I mean, for instance, I look around this world and like it all feels so chaotically deliberate. But I mean, like, was there someone going through like individually hand placing each and every one of these objects? Sorry, Nathan, I'm gonna need you to ask that one again. I will ask you for a moment. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just saying, like, the this world feels really chaotic yet deliberate and so mm. when you're when you're making a game of this scope with a relatively small team like how does that unfold like did someone actually go through the game and like physically place every object and every structure and yep man yep. i mean there are some i um, there are some kind of clever well clever ish uh, methods that we've used um to I think make our lives a little bit easier. Um, the art direction, while very deliberate and intentional, also lends itself to um, some aspects that make our lives easier. There are no textures in the game to speak of. Um, I mean, there's some functional textures that are used for specific purposes, but not in the traditional sense. So um, if we were doing traditional texturing, 
if we were doing uh, baking lights into these enormous environments, like this would take an absurd amount of time. Uh, using this uh, kind of unique visual aesthetic also permitted us to um, to get away with things that like you don't have a visual reference for how a polygonal world that gets extracted from my brain should look. And if you do, we're far too close. Like, like how, how did you get in my head to know what this should look like? <laughs> so we can get away with absurd lighting and absurd, absurd things that, um, that look really cool in the context of this world as, and they should, that's how they should look. But, uh, they also can kind of lend themselves to, to a slightly less, uh, yeah, slightly, maybe a slightly easier workflow. Um, yeah, and just choosing choosing smart uh, smart tools that make our lives a little bit easier as well. Mm-hmm. Um, well yeah, I don't know. I, I guess it is. It, it it was a lot of work for sure. And if you saw how much of the world got thrown away too, you you might uh, you, you might be surprised at the number of cool things we made that uh, that got tossed because they weren't cool enough. Wow. How much was that? Like, and also, I mean, when you have to throw out something that you put that much work into, like, how agonizing is that decision? It can be tough. Uh, Sometimes it's not. Um, I think the things that stayed, stayed because they were good. If something, if something left, it left because it wasn't good or it wasn't, wasn't good enough. Um, um, yeah, and the sheer amount of stuff. Oh man, it's terrifying. The number of assets I created that are that are gone. So uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's. I think it was part of the process. Um, and at some points, it felt like, oh, why are we building this stuff? Uh, and only to throw it out. But I think also part of that lesson was it was part of refining this world. So we couldn't know that that didn't work until. We uh, we really kind of evaluated what we had built in that world. Yeah. Hmm. So I mean, do you have like a rough number, or like not even a number, but a percentage of like just what you threw out? And also, is there like when when something like that happens? Do you just out of curiosity? Do you like delete it wholesale, or you're like, I'm gonna keep this on my hard drive because maybe I could use it later for something. Uh, I'm a digital pack rat, so yes, I keep this stuff. Um, much to the chagrin of everyone else on the project, because it, it bloats the project. Blah, you know, it, it's not the most efficient. But I am a pack rat, and how much stuff? At least another fract worth of stuff is gone. At least maybe yeah. two fracts. This whole game you're looking at, at least this much stuff is gone. Yeah. yeah. Do you think you? I mean. Is it like stuff that's just irredeemable, like you, you could never use it, or do you ever think like, well, maybe if we just tweak this stuff, we could just make another fract? Um, a little bit of both, honestly. I think there, there, there were definitely some interesting things that didn't make a cut, the cut, but they could have with a, with a bit more love and a bit more polish in the game. Um, but a lot of the stuff just was, just was like beautiful first tries of madly broken garbage so uh yeah that that stuff is long gone no regrets but no there's certainly a few a few interactions and a few few objects that were special but maybe we couldn't get them working on that sort of fine line we were discussing before between Mm -hmm. bewilderment and empowerment like maybe it was maybe it was too easy or maybe it was unclear enough so there there's definitely there's definitely some things that i think uh think with some love could could uh, could have could have made it but I don't know I, I, I'm really happy with uh, we're all really happy with the state of this world now so um, um, I don't I don't know that it, it might be a bit like shoehorning these objects back in if we were to get them back in at this point hmm. do you have any specific example that specific examples of stuff that you wanted to include but just decided that couldn't make it past the cutting room floor. Um, so this isn't really spoilery, I guess, but there's sort of um, three areas to the game. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and these three areas kind of have some visual language, some color coding. And then there's another sort of category of objects in the game that you interact with that are kind of toys um, that don't have a direct sort of, uh, like, direct impact on the game. On the game. They could be used, they're, they're there if you want to play with them or not. For instance, those sort of platforms you were sliding up and down mm-hmm. were an example of those. And there was, there, was a few, uh, there was a few of those sort of musical um, optional toys that, uh, that weren't tight enough to make it into the final version of the game that um, that that I think you know they would have been they would have been good um, but they they didn't quite fit and they were they weren't refined enough um, in the end hmm. and it would have been a little awkward to insert them uh, one in particular was uh, if there's any synth dorks watching this uh, uh, like envelopes they're the sort of the way the synthesizer behaves over time and one of them was this uh, interesting toy that uh, sort of in, is based on the envelope of the synthesizer uh, but yeah it just it just would have felt like it would have felt a little out of place without more love and uh, even if even if we could have made it fit it still would have felt um a bit incongruous with the rest of the world. I feel like everything in here right now is is fitting in a way we feel comfortable with, and I think that even even though that was cool, it still didn't have that. Uh, it still didn't fit as well as we would have liked. Hmm. So, I mean, how much tech did you develop to create these in-game instruments? Um, so, uh, Hank actually um, developed pretty much an entire sound engine for the game. Um, so that we could do a lot of the synthesis in real time. So basically there's uh, like a, a series of synthesizers, uh, like virtual synthesizers running in the background at all times. Um, and that's something that conventional game audio just does not do. Um, and we needed to do that in, th- in order to give the player the control to shape the sounds. Um, so as you're interacting with the puzzle, you're solving puzzle elements, but you're also shaping the sound of that synthesizer that is reacting to what you do. Um, and that, that puzzle you played earlier where you wrote those little passages of gameplay, mm-hmm. or part of those little passages of music, um, in order to... like puzzle you played just precedent that just before that was actually shaping the synthesizer that you used in that puzzle um, and interactions like this are not just not possible with conventional sound engines so we we developed that tech Hank developed that tech and as it evolved it started interacting with the game more and more as opposed to just sending information to the audio engine to make pretty sounds excuse me um, it also started uh, over the years, like it was a much more bi-directional set of communications, um, and that took us a long time to get right. Um, but I think it was worth it because I believe that um, the connection that people make, whether consciously or subconsciously, to these sounds is greater as a result. Yeah, certainly. How much were you personally involved in the in the world design? Um. I did pretty much like the world you see here. That's that's me. But we also had um, someone uh, someone who came on early that really helped us kind of see the world in a different light. Uh, Devin Lulin Vega or Alice Effect. I, I think you guys may have covered some of his stuff in the past. Um, when we had sort of these rough playgrounds of puzzles and uh, the sort of like the previous version of the world, um, he he helped us really see how to build our world because we were kind of caught up in our systems and in our puzzles and he kind of built uh, a first version of this world and that really helped uh, prime me to massage it into what, you, what you're in there now, what you're in now, yeah. So a lot of credit to him for helping us see our own world in a different light. Yeah. Huh. So when you're making a place like this, like where does where does it come from? How does it start? Is it are you trying to initially evoke a feeling or are you trying to make like a place that is kind of in its own weird way grounded? Like it, it makes sense on some structural level that maybe isn't readily apparent because I'm not some sort of polygon alien. Um <laughs> 
Like, where, where do you begin? Um, so, I mean, we do have, there are, like, these areas of the game, and uh, so we do, we do sort of make some assumptions about the rules and according to kind of the architecture and how that, the world would evolve around that. Um, and then from there, it's about uh, evoking interesting, interesting to me spaces. So I'm, I'm, a lot of it, a lot of it, I guess, comes from here. Um, but um, it was really about building, uh, building an interesting and sort of integrated space based on, based on, um, based on some are like arguably pretty simple, um, pretty simple kind of creative decisions. Yeah. So I mean, like, could you give a rundown of this particular location? Like, what your thought was on like, like why is that pink thing there? Like, why is why are there circles in the sky like i can i I don't want to i don't want to uh like i said before i don't want to taint anyone's experience with my own reasons too much but let's say um um those the pinker area and the pinker structures are devoted to a certain synthesizer a lead synthesizer and lead synths tend to be uh higher pitched and they tend to stick out in a mix they tend to carry the more the melodies and um they tend to be predominant in in music but they're also predominant in this space they're also they're also higher up they're also uh, a bit more in your face and a bit more dramatic. So some of those sort of sonic aesthetic decisions shaped the aesthetic decisions. Um, th- and the, the particular structure you're standing in right now is in the pad area of the game. Um, and pads are typically softer, washier um, synthesizers in electronic music. Um, and in this case, our pad synth has, and this is getting a bit technical in terms of synthesizers, multiple voices. So it was, um, and pads kind of serve a very particular and sort of a flowing purpose. So the type of energy in each area is also um, kind of analogous to uh, the musical aspects of the synthesizers that define each area as well. Sure. Yeah. And then that big thing up there in the sky. Well, I'm gonna let. I'm not gonna spoil that. <laughs> wow, that is. That's just all kind of crazy. Simply because, like, I, I feel like a lot of people play games, but don't necessarily pay that much attention to the environments, like, because they're they're sort of a means to an end. And I feel like this game. Pre- prevents kind of a necessary ex- exception to that rule because you need to be in tune with the environment to figure out how to solve the puzzles. But I think a lot of more modern games have trained us to sort of ignore the environment and just get from point A to point B. Uh, I thank you for saying that. I mean, I think part of we're trying, but I mean, <laughs> um, again, you know, and it's not it's not something I, even though I kind of maybe shared a bit more than I have. Uh, before I equally I don't want to force that down anyone's throat like if they just want to run through the game and solve puzzles that's totally cool too uh, they don't I'm, I'm not expecting people to have to want to know those sort of things that inspired us to make this world but I guess that comes back to the the, the why resistant approach you know it's like well it looks like this because we thought it should uh, because of this reason and I think, um, and again, they don't have to be profound reasons when you say, why is it like this? Um, but I think it, it, it does lend itself to, uh, I do think it can lend itself to uh, a more meaningful, uh, uh, more meaningful kind of system. That's not to say you can't achieve incredibly meaningful things by just uh, impro- improvising or just coming up with, with anything off. You know, that's totally possible too. But I know that's important to my process, at least. Hmm. So I'm noticing right here, like, a lot of what's guiding me is both environmental cues and little sounds. Hmm. How do you design sound to guide a player versus just to, you know, be there in the background? Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, and I think it's my, like, I'm... I'm a big UI dork, like I love UI, uh, and I feel like UI and sound are kind of 
this um, underappreciated aspect of games. Um, and so much can be conveyed uh, and achieved and completely failed with both of those things. So, you know, I better not, I better not say that our game is perfect in that regard. But, <laughs> um, um, but I, especially with sound, I think both sound and UI are those things where when they work, you don't notice them. Um, especially UI. And I think when a sound sounds out of place or a sound's kind of giving you the, the wrong feedback, then it's, then, it, then it's not kind of doing its job. Um, but we definitely, you know, there's been a lot of iteration of the, of the sound design. Um, and Mogi uh, Grumbles, our uh, composer, has definitely iterated a lot on the, uh, some of the music design and the puzzles as well. So it's, it's been, um, yeah, it's been a like uh, very iterative process finding the right feel for the sounds. Uh, a lot of it is a lot of it's intuitive too. Like I, I do a lot of the sound design for like the sound effects and the uh, the sort of event sounds in the game, and uh, a lot of that a lot of that is kind of intuitive. And I think what's interesting is like my style and Mogi's style are different but complementary. So um, my style of sound design. I think complements Mogi's uh, like musicality well because they're different enough to sound um, sound like uh, different information in the game, but they still get along pretty well. Well, then the other, I mean, aside from music, obviously, I think a big thing that I've noticed here is like when when someone says music game to me, I sort of enter with this expectation of there's going to be music like all the time. It's going to be everywhere. And there's a lot of silence in this game as well. And so how do you, how did you decide to, where to apply restraint versus lots of sound, even, you know, to a cacophonous effect? Um, I think it's tricky balance. And I think even, even though we're really happy with where it ended up, I think there's some areas of the game that can be a bit cacophonous and a bit quiet because it's dynamic in a lot of ways. Like there's a degree of flexibility where it's like, we can't always be sure. The, the, the puzzles you're playing with right now are a really actually interesting example of that. Um, um, in the last puzzle of this series of the green area, uh, well, of this type of puzzle, there's a lot of flexibility in the final solution. Uh, mm -hmm. And that changes the sound dramatically differently, depending on how you solve it. And that can produce radically different musical effects based on the puzzle that that affects. Um, so designing that has been a really interesting challenge for Mogi, and I think an interesting challenge for myself and us as well. Um, but coming back to the idea of silence, um, we, we actually scaled back, um, I think, there's also been kind of major iterations of the score, the sort of mm. dynamic score that reacts to your choices. And the previous kind of major iteration was uh, was quite banging, to use the term. <laughs> and we definitely uh, we definitely felt like there was there was a lot of, and that's a better place to be, like have banging and then be able to sort of scale back a little bit, like right, the right, the intensity, and. Um, yeah, uh, that was, and I often gravitated to, I was just so happy with a lot of uh, Mogi's work that I'd be like, make it more banging. But then once we once we got to a point where things were really starting to be cohesive, we're like, okay, let's scale back. We need to establish a, uh, a better progression here. And I think that's where the silence comes in as well. Uh, there's definitely quiet sections of the game. There's almost almost no silence whatsoever. There's a bit of silence later in the game that you'll see, but but um, it's um, it's about those peaks and those valleys. It's about those dynamics. It's about the um, yeah. It's about it's about the differences. It's a, yeah. So that's 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 been really important. But it wasn't an instantaneous. Oh, we'll keep it quiet here. We'll keep it loud there, and what have you. It uh, it definitely evolved. Uh, it evolved over the course of the game for sure. Hmm. Yeah, this now is... you're getting it. Now you're starting to piece it together. <laughs> so, outside of the context of the game, 
I was told by a very reliable source that I should ask you about heavy metal. Ah, interesting. Um, I think I know your source. Uh, <laughs> interestingly, when I first sketched out this idea, it was not an electronic music game. It was a stoner rock game, desert rock game. Um, and uh, that quickly kind of, I quickly sort of shut that down because, like, my stoner rock buddies, they're awesome, but I don't think I could have got this game done with my stoner rock buddies because they're stoners. They wouldn't have, you know, when I said, oh, I need some audio here, eh, they would have been busy or something. <laughs> so the choice was made to, uh, since I was comfortable uh, with at least a prototype uh, built writing my own music on that scale. That's kind of why I chose. But yeah, I mean, I listen to all types of music and uh, for sure, um, stoner rock, desert rock, and like really heavy stuff as well has been uh, uh, hugely influential on me as well. I, I'm sure I have a, a model of a cactus. Like I did a, a super polygonal, like almost uh, fract esque uh, model of a cactus. Just and that was like my first test, and then I was like, no, this, <laughs> this is not going to work out. I like the aesthetic, but I was just like, oh, there's no way I can get my stoner buddies to make a soundtrack in time. So yeah, who knows? Maybe next project. Stoner rock, hardcore heavy metal, black metal, who knows? Yeah, interesting. I don't think there's really been a game that's been like kind of, you know, desert rock, stoner rock influenced. Or even like a proper, no, that's not fair. Uh, even like a really like serious metal game. I think Brutal Legend was, uh, yeah, I was, was playful say. and like it definitely celebrated like, you know, that sort of hard rock, cock rock kind of vibe, which is super cool and awesome. Uh, but like, has there been like a serious black metal game and would that be awesome like <laughs> it might be super oppressive and kind of depressing but it could also be super awesome too for sure it's true although i, I feel like my favorite metal is at least it has a degree of self-awareness i mean because yeah, metal true. can be like so oppressive in like yeah. what it's trying to do and it's like well if you don't if you don't like laugh at yourself every once in a while then you just seem like someone who's shouting a bunch and everyone else is like laughing at you yeah, I'm a big Mashuga fan, and they're very self-aware. Uh, yeah, they're 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 very self-aware. They can totally have fun, but they're they're yeah they're metal gods as well. Well, whatever. Music subjective. Some people will probably think Mashuga's too soft. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, it's always the weird dichotomy with metal. Some people are just like, it's good if it's as heavy as it can possibly be. Like, who cares about the musicality? It's just it's got to be. It's it's weirdly hierarchical. Yeah, and I'm I'm a strong proponent proponent of slower is heavier. Mm. Like the, our game is 80 BPM, which is slow, but the whole world tempo is 80 BPM because I really like yeah, that there's a weight to slowness that I feel I've always felt is 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 heavier than the really fast stuff. Yeah, so yeah, I like I like it slow. Heavier is slower, kids, don't forget. <laughs> Let's see. I'm once again at an impasse. Okay, you want a little hint? Yes. Okay, so you've got a beam coming out of that green one down the end there. So go into your interact mode for a second mm -hmm. and turn that one more step clockwise. So it's pointing at three o'clock. Mm -hmm. You're pointing at nine there, ah, or maybe I'm seeing lag. Wait, let me. There you go, three o'clock. And then let go. Maybe something will click here. Ah. Yeah, because I was, I mean, I noticed these big things here and I was like, what's that for? I guess the world was never meant to find out. And finally. Ta-da! You're in business. I am. Most certainly. I definitely like how the music builds on itself. Like, I think that's a very... 
a very subtly rewarding thing. Because, mm. you know, in a lot of cases, like, whether it's a game or really anything else, you just, you get a song. And a song yeah. is one whole thing. But, like, getting little gradual pieces of it feels very satisfying. Yeah, we've been getting that feedback from a lot of people, and it, I'm, I'm glad, because it's not... I, I wasn't familiar with a lot of precedent for building those sort of uh, rewards and those sort of interactions. Maybe maybe they're out there, and I just I, I just wasn't familiar. Um, but, yeah, like that was definitely something that we felt was maybe new to us, and uh, we were really happy that that is, that is connecting with people. So you're uh, you're very much about like letting players take away their own thing from your game, but you when you're actually in the moment watching people, how tempting is it to be like, "Hey, maybe you should do this"? Uh, I've had to train myself to uh, to hold back, um, but I also think the game kind of got to a point where it was doing its job a couple months ago, and we could just sit back and watch people. I think there were points where. We weren't communicating what needed to be communicated, and it was kind of like, well, we want that experience of people to just go in and tinker and maybe take what they can out of it. But we weren't supplying with them with the tools and the information to do it. So it was that was frustrating. Um, and again, you know, the tools that we have settled on might not fit for everyone, but I think it's like I think it's as like I think it's right now. So. Yeah, uh, it used to be incredibly painful to watch people play um, <laughs> puzzle games, especially. Um, there's also kind of this vibe of like, well, he made the game. He's watching me try and fix the game, like fix the puzzle. And I think there's there's also like a two way kind of communi like aspect of the communication that gets a bit tainted in that regard. Uh, for some people, not for everybody. But yeah, that as well. It's almost like an exam, <laughs> but, yeah. but especially especially PAX. By the time we were at PAX, and before we were at PAX, I think the game was the game was there. So it was it was really kind of relieving to just say, "Here you go, have fun," and just sort of standing back. And uh, we would typically let people get to the get to their aha moment, um, and then and then. You know, and then be like, okay, there's, you know, your your 30, 45 minutes is up. We'd love someone else to play, but um, but it is, it's really, yeah, it's really rewarding to to hear that people are making those aha moments, to making making those connections. my silence. <laughs> <laughs> like, huh? Different, different people uh, assess and connect to differently. Um, for instance, like I know Hank, a uh, programmer, like his favorite section is this section of the game. Like predominantly, he will say without hesitation, oh yeah, pad section, spectrum section, and, um, uh, you know, it was really interesting to see firsthand uh, people take away, um, like, develop their own methods for solving these puzzles, because we do, we, you know, we do provide enough information, and there is, like, a certain amount of information, and there is, um, there, there's a couple solutions to this puzzle, but, I mean, even recently, I found that there's more solutions to this puzzle than even I knew, which is which is which is kind of interesting. Huh. 
Oh, I think he may have solved it here. I think he may have solved it randomly, but I think he may have solved it. Because I'm not too sure he knew how he solved it right now. We'll see. This might solve it. Well done, sir. But then again, like, that's an example of, um, of, uh, of a not perfect interaction right there. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. Like, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure you're not exactly sure how you solved that puzzle. No, I'm honestly that not. could be wrong. Okay. And that, that means that for that particular puzzle in this particular instance, like, you, you, you like, the information that we were trying to give you, we didn't, like, it, it didn't resonate with you. And that's, it's, it's possible. I mean, I did see the way you solved the other puzzles, the other sequencer puzzles, mm -hmm. and it was clear to me that you were uh, assessing the information that we were trying to give you there. So, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky balance for sure, you know. So what was the intended takeaway on that one? Because obviously there were a few oh. of the grids that were a little bit darker, so they stood out. Yeah, well, there's a hint on that first one to try and show you uh, a, a lesson about that particular sequencer. But there's also, at every sequencer, there's objects in the space that are giving you information about objectives, music, like timing and musical objectives. And I'm not sure that you you were you were kind of focusing on those, but maybe you were and I didn't notice. Hmm. But it's possible. Yikes. And each one of these sort of uh, objects that you're rotating and standing on at the same time, um, they also modulate the synthesizer. So the synths that are playing as you're solving this puzzle, you're actually shaping the sounds. Huh. That is a really... So, like you were saying earlier, your whole world is tied into this background synth. So, in effect, it's one giant instrument. Yep. In a way, um, we we also have. I, I, I would be uh, I'd be fibbing if I said we weren't using samples as well. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the musical components that react and sort of fill in, like those layers you were describing in the last puzzle, those are uh, those are done with samples. But you are shaping the core musical synth of every puzzle. Yeah. Huh. You've made quite an interesting thing here. Pardon me, you I you you Sorry, uh, I said you you've you, made yeah. you've made quite an interesting thing here. Yeah, I uh, think that is roughly everything I had to ask about. Um, let's see, just to double check. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a pleasure having you on. This has been yeah, really man, cool. Yeah, man, heavy metal. <laughs> and yes, heavy metal. Cheers, man. Yeah. And the hallway hallway shooter game. Yes. That it's needs to be made. Kind of that should be your next project. Yeah. Let's turn wrap my head around it. Do we go all anti-chamber and you're like folding hallways into hallways or Well and you could even call it like anti-chamber, like like because you're against the chambers. Like. Or anti-chamber with an E which which 